From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. In the two years since Attorney General Peter Kilmartin took over from Patrick Lynch, the AG's office has mostly avoided big headlines and big controversies. But behind the scenes, Kilmartin is keeping busy. He wants his former colleagues in the General Assembly to approve a long list of bills, including an expansion of Rhode Island's gun laws. He's also overseeing investigations of major scandals, including 38 Studios and Dan Doyle's Institute for International Sport. Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Attorney General Peter Kilmartin. Good morning. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and political reporter for Rhode Island Public Radio, Ian Donis. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, General. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me back. Uh, we're going to start this week with Ted Nisi. Ted. I think last time you were with us, we were on the couch. During yeah, that's the right. Site <laughs> redesign, which is I think a, there was a little, a little more the, the dark time in the newsmaker <laughs> yeah, studio. Yeah, we, we don't talk too much about it. But, <laughs> um, General, I want to start. It was actually a year ago this month that the 38 Studio scandal explosive, exploded. Tim mentioned it at the top. Um, reading through the state's lawsuit against, which is a civil suit against uh, the people who sort of put that together, they're accused of of uh, fraud, negligence, misleading the board. Um, are we going to see criminal charges in the 38 series case if there's that much fraud and negligence as the state's asserting in the civil side? Well, let's take a step back. Obviously, that civil case was brought by private attorneys that the state hired. Um, I personally have never even acknowledged whether or not the state or our office in particular was investigating that case. I know it has been reported that the state police has an ongoing investigation. And uh, just because something said in a civil case by civil attorneys does not necessarily equate to a criminal case with a criminal investigation. There are two different types of investigation, and that's historically the way that goes. So uh, that I know of, no evidence has been provided to the state or to the state police from the civil attorneys. Um, of the the allegations of criminal activity, uh, so it's a case that is ongoing and hopefully will be resolved soon. But these cases, like every investigation, take time. You know, a lot of people say it's been a year. What takes so long? But generally speaking, and you folks have all been around at least as long as I, if not longer. Um, these cases take a while, and they often lead down roads that were unforeseen at the time. As, as you said, the state police colonel, Stephen O'Donnell, he's the one that said that we are looking into it. Is that answer right there an acknowledgment that there is, in fact, an investigation into 38 Studios? You confirming what, what the colonel is no, saying? No, I said the colonel said it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's pivot to um, what's happening up at the State House. A lot of um, talk over gun control there. And one of the bills in the package of legislation would make the AG's office the clearinghouse for issuing gun permits. Right now, the law states that local chiefs, quote, shall issue a gun permit. The new law has a significant word change. It says the AG's office may issued, uh, issue a concealed gun permit. Do gun proponents have a reason to be worried here? That gives your office a lot of discretion. How do you decide if someone can or cannot carry a concealed weapon? Well. With all due respect, what you said isn't exactly true. Well, correct me. Because the AG's office currently does the majority of gun permits in the state, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, we already have the word may in the statute that allows us to do the permitting of guns. So there's a dichotomy in the state where the chiefs of police have the shall, the AG's office have the may, even with the may. But, but, but how often does the Attorney General's office step in? And, and it, we, Are you saying the AG's office can overrule a local chief the way it's written now? No, 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 no. That's what I'm saying. There's, there's a, it, it's a dual track. One could choose to go to a chief of police. One could go to the AG's office. We do the, most people come to our office okay. for the gun permits, as opposed to going to the local chief of police, for whatever reason. I, I candidly don't know why. That's the their choice. What we're in the problem lies is one, for instance, in the issue of a domestic violence. If the th legal threshold of um, the need is present in the local jurisdiction, the chief of police, the statute says shall issue. Well, they may have a whole bunch of bunch of incident reports that have domestic violence cases that maybe weren't brought to full prosecution. And that's a topic we can get into later if you want. 
but it's been reported recently that 66 to 70 percent of uh, DV cases at the misdemeanor level that are handled by cities and towns um, are not fully prosecuted for whatever reason. Most of them are dismissed. Well, they may have enough incident reports at the local level to say, we have a concern with this individual having a gun. But the, under the statute, you shall issue. If I go to a chief of police, which we do, we, we request a letter from them to see what information they have on somebody, and they say, there's a concern. This person has a lot of domestic arrests, but nothing ever came of it. You know, that would be a factor weighing in in our office as to the may. Well, but will the, that but go? The, but you bring up an interesting point. Is that going to, in, in a, in a sense, disappear? I mean, right now you have local chi chiefs, and by and large, they know their towns very well, and they know if you know, Joe Blow has had a problem over on Smith Street. Uh, and maybe had a, a domestic violence case that was not prosecuted. Will that evaporate in any way where that level of knowledge at the attorney general's level at, at that at your office won't be there because there isn't that rub where the rubber meets the road no, law enforcement? No, um, and, and, and that's the burden that will be placed upon us uh, because it'll be incumbent on us to reach out to the individual chiefs of police to get feedback as to what the person's history So is. each gun permit you're going to go we to We do the, that now. You do that now. We do that now. And by the way, 90% of the permits that come to our office are approved. 90%. So you there don't anticipate 30, that changing with no, the new law? This, this, it, there's nothing in the prior. This is a case of people, um, it's almost chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. This is a system that has been in place for several attorneys general. And I am just the latest of several. There's nothing in the statute that will change the process within our office. Nothing. Payday lending is one of the other issues before the General Assembly. Critics say payday lending is a predatory practice because many of the loans are at an annual interest rate of 260 percent. There are two bills. One would cut that annual interest rate to 130 percent, the other to 36 percent. Do you support either of those bills? I don't think we should eliminate payday lending. I think it has its place in the marketplace. There is definitely anecdotal evidence that people have been harmed. I've read that in news reports. That's how I have my information on the topic, candidly. Um, so I do think the General Assembly needs to do some due diligence and look at the best method to, one, have a system in place for people to access cash when they need it, but at the same time, make it a system that is not so egregious that it ends up costing people double of what uh, the initial uh, principle was. So it sounds like you don't support either of the bills presently. No, I, I candidly haven't done the, the vetting that the General Assembly has done on the bill. That's not an issue that's before my office or my units. But so, you do have a responsibility as an advocate for consumers, as, as oh, Attorney General. absolutely. And we're advocating on dozens of bills, including over 30 of my own. Um, so, as I said, should payday lending be reined in, I do believe that the in interest rate should be lowered, and I think the General Assembly is getting into the, the, through the hearing process as to what is the appropriate level. What do you think the appropriate level is? W whatever their due diligence uh, comes out with. And just in closing on that, you were a state rep for 20 years. Yes. Did, did you vote in favor of the carve-out that created the payday lending industry in Rhode Island? I, with thousands of votes, I couldn't tell you honestly. Another uh, consumer issue, uh, Attorney General, um, this is a little wonky, but hopefully people stick with us on it. The, it might be above my head. This is, no, no, because you're working on this. It's uh, part of the foreclosure crisis. The Mortgage Electronic Registration System is a system the big banks created to sort of move mortgages around electronically without actually going down to the local clerk's office, paying the fee, mm -hmm. and, and uh, dealing with mortgage paperwork that way. You've put in a bill to, uh, to basically to end that practice in Rhode Island. Can you explain why and, and why this is important? I think the MERS system, as it's called in the vernacular, is a system that contributed to, I won't say it was the cause, but I think contributed to the banking crisis that we just um, are finally hopefully coming out of, uh, that led to the recession, if not depression, that we are hopefully finally coming out of. What happens is they pool all of these mortgages, and then they get sold to trusts or whomever, and different people also service the mortgages. Now, I don't have a problem with who services the mortgage. If MERS is the servicing agent, that's fine. What I would like to know, though, is when someone is getting foreclosed upon, that that person can actually go down to the city or town hall, 
look at the record and know who actually owns their mortgage. And right now they can't. And right now they can't. Now, um, just last month, the Rhode Island Supreme Court actually upheld the right of MERS, this, this electronic system, to foreclose on people. Uh, would that case have gone differently if this bill was law, or does it only look forward at future mortgages? No, the, the Rhode Island Supreme case that just came down on this issue said that the MERS system, as it exists in the Rhode Island statutory scheme, is legal. What this bill would do would, um, in effect, say it would no longer be legal moving forward. Do you have any concerns that the banks would, would pull out of mortgage lending in Rhode Island if this went through because this well, is a system they like? You know, that, that's what they're alleging and I, and I anecdotally will tell you last night I was looking at some, some old legislation I did and in 2004 I did a lot of bills regarding Bank of America when they were taking over Fleet National Bank and there were promises made then that we will be in Rhode Island forever. We're going to be in the Superman building forever. Here we are, less than 10 years later. They've downsized. They're, you know, do they have a presence? Here they do. But clearly it's not the presence they once had. So I don't necessarily take everything that the banks say or threaten um, to heart. They may do it minimally, but you've got to remember something. These big banks, we have plenty of local players who do plenty of mortgages in this state um, and who are accessible. So. We'll see where their threats go. General, uh, we're coming up against a break uh, pretty soon. We have to go. But uh, I want to, before I ask this question, I want to point out that this program is being taped on May 17th. A lot of people are watching it over Memorial Day weekend. Uh, the Obama administration is getting heat because it was revealed the Department of Justice ob obtained the phone records of hundreds of reporters uh, from the Associated Press. They were looking for a leak after the AP filed a story in 2012 about a thwarted terrorist attack. Is there a scenario? in which you could see your office obtaining reporters records in an effort to plug a leak or investigate anything? Absolutely not. For the government to go in and do what it's alleged they have done against these AP reporters, be it on uh, phones in the pool, as I am reading the media reports, whether it was phones in, the, in their own offices, I can never envision myself going to the presiding justice and saying, Will you sign this warrant so I can investigate these phones? I just don't see it happening. Are you just I, saying I, that we because we have a table no. of reporters here, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Because you know, there, there's a balance here, um, and the balance is there. There are First Amendment protections and protections for the press, where if you get a source, you get a source, and you should hold that source. Silent. Yeah, but here's a here's a trick. Um, I can go to jail if I don't reveal my source the way it is now. Would you, I have you no problem with the shield law. So you support a federal shield law? I've said that for several years now. Okay. All right. We're going to um, take a break here on Newsmakers. Our guest is Attorney General Patrick. Uh, I almost said Patrick <laughs> Lane. Peter Kill Martin. Old habits die hard. <laughs> Sorry, General. We'll be right back on Newsmakers. Stay with us. So much for talking. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, Ted Nisi and Ian Donis. Our guest this week is Attorney General Peter Kilmartin. General, um, your office supported changes and pushed champion changes to the uh, Access to Public Records Act last year, something that I was involved uh, with as well. Uh, specifically in there was a new balancing test. And I remember being uh, up at the State House. Your office had argued that more information would be made public because of the new law. You know, we're hearing now examples of police departments, particularly in Providence, uh, withholding more information than they have in the past, and it's being put on the shoulders of the, of the balancing test. Wondering if that concerns you, and if there is anything your office can do to make sure, possibly auditing police departments, to make sure that, this, uh, that we're not taking a step backwards here. First, uh, why they are doing that, I do not know. There should be nothing in the new statute that's been updated that should change the way police reports are handled or disseminated to the press. Um, and we do trainings all the time. Uh, you folks have, been par uh, have attended some of our trainings, but we've gone to um, clerk's offices, to police stations, to anyone who will have us. But the law has around. changed, so the training presumably has changed. Do you think there's something but, in but that training, training that is... In, in that one particular area, there should be no real change. So what I would ask you folks to do is if you have these individual cases, bring them to us. Bring them to us, and then if there's a valid complaint on your part, we will go to Providence Police or whatever the police department is, and 
um, hopefully have them come in compliance and change their practices. Okay. General, Landmark Medical Center in Woonsocket has been in receivership for about five years. It's the second largest employer in northern Rhode Island, so there's a lot of concern about that. What is the status of the application by Prime Healthcare Services to acquire Landmark, and why hasn't your office deemed that application complete? It's, it's not complete because they haven't provided all the information for which we have asked. Um, because of confidentialities in the ap application process, I can't tell you what those um, deficiencies are, but needless to say, they exist, and we're working hard to get them to, to provide us the information necessary. We've had meetings literally this week within the past couple of days on this with Prime trying to say, look, this is exactly what we're looking for. Please provide it. There are folks up there who are waiting. They're nervous. Uh, they want to have access to health care. Uh, in the meantime, we have several other um, three other hospitals in various stages of the process. June 11th, we're doing a public hearing for uh, Care New England and Memorial when that, um, as that merger progresses. L&M and Westerly Hospital down there is moving along nicely. And, and we, it's not atypical for us to have to extract information, if you will, from the buying entities or the parties um, because, you know, maybe they don't either want to turn it over or don't think they have to turn it over. Um, so we're just trying to work with them and keeping those lines of communication over, open to say, it's, look, it's not an adversa adversarial process. Can you specify a timetable for completing this process? Uh, with Landmark? Yes. Uh, it will go as quickly as they provide us the information. And when you look at the future of health care in Rhode Island, do you think it's realistic 10 years out, 15 years out for these community hospitals outside of Providence to survive, or does is it only feasible for Rhode Island to have a more centralized healthcare system based in Providence? It's increasingly difficult for the small independent community hospital to survive. We're seeing them fall by the wayside now. And I think personally, 10 years from now, you will just see hospital systems in existence. And the, the day of the community hospital sadly will be non-existent. That's, that's my gut feeling as to where this is going, if, and based on everything we're doing with hospitals. Another question for you on housing. Um, I've been reading reports lately, the big $25 billion settlement that the attorneys general signed with the big banks uh, about the foreclosure crisis, the checks are going out, and people have been angered because in some cases they're getting just a few hundred dollars after losing their homes, and the consultant hired uh, wrote some bad checks and, and messed up when the money was in the accounts. I mean, are you satisfied with the, with the rollout of how this settlement is being administered? The best part of the way this be is being administered is we have someone in place to do oversight of it. A gentleman, gentleman named Smith, he was the banking commissioner or an assistant to the attorney general on banking from, I believe, North Carolina. And all of that accountability will be um, brought forward, and they will be held accountable to make sure that the folks who need the money are getting the money. Senator Elizabeth Warren said uh, the other day, families are getting just pennies on the dollar in the settlement. In retrospect, do you, do you think you guys, the attorneys general, got enough out of the banks? Put it this way, if I could indict every bank, I would, but I don't, number one, have the authority to do that due to the uh, limitations on our office. But number two, I think banks should be held more accountable across the board. Just yesterday, I read, read where the feds are going, going to change a regulation loosening derivatives where less banks take control of assets such as interest rates, assets that are built on interest rates and things like that. It's going to go down from five banks which will cut competition down to two banks nationally. These derivative issues are the same things that led to the crash many years ago where the United States government had to bail out AIG insurance and now we're going back down that road. Dodd-Frank is not impl being implemented the way it should be, and, if, and that's egregious. That's egregious. We need more accountability on the federal level for the state's attorney general to have to step in and be the lead on the case that you just mentioned for 49 states to sign on holding the banks accountable. Number one, commend us for it, but number two, shame on the federal government. They should have been there stepping up. Now, we did partner with DOJ in doing this. The U.S. Department of Justice. Right. Exactly. But the Fed should be doing a lot more. And this derivative issue is just the latest where we could go back to a lot of people making a lot of money at the expense of everybody else in America. 
right. and, from, and leading to another problem. From policy to crime and pu punishment, I want to ask you about a specific case. Brown basketball player Joseph Sharkey was allegedly assaulted by 25-year-old Tory Lucier of Connecticut. Um, we're, we're now learning that he and his brothers uh, were charged in a similar crime, an assault in their home state. I'm wondering if that troubles you and what what is the impact of competing cases? You have a case with a district attorney in Connecticut, and now there's the case with the attorney general's office in Rhode Island. Does that impact the case here? That absolutely could impact the case here because depending on where they are in their system, that could slow our case down. Depending on where we are in our system, it could slow their case down. Obviously, we just arraigned him as of this taping today. Right, May 17th. May 17th. So he still has to go back to Connecticut and be held accountable there probably be uh, charged with bail violation because it's my understanding he's out on bail on those Connecticut charges. So all of that will, will probably forestall our case a bit. Can, can you use the evidence in the Connecticut case um, here in the Rhode Island case? Oh, we, we're at the very early stages of the investigation. We don't even know where that Connecticut case is going. What is troubling is you now have allegations that are similar in two states pending. That's extremely troubling. Very controversial cases often land on the AG's office here in Rhode Island. Patrick Lynch had the station fire. Uh, Sheldon Whitehouse had the deaths of Cornell Young and Jennifer Rivera. Jeffrey Pine had the strike force in the Dupree case. Your t uh, tenure has been uh, not marked by that kind of high profile controversy. So what has been your greatest challenge as Attorney General? That's an interesting question. Um, well, one of the, it's really the caseload that we're getting. You know, we've had a lot of, we always get the murders, you know that. We always get those heinous felony cases, but a lot of them are taking uh, an emotional toll. You know, we've had, uh, we just closed the Greenslit case, which was a dismemberment. We now have a new case that just came to us, the Taylor case, where someone allegedly dismembered his, his mother. We just went through uh, the Lepalusa case, where the individual stabbed someone a hundred times. Uh, the, these are challenging cases. Some of the other challenging cases that we've had in, during my tenure that maybe don't make a headline, and in some cases may have, the Berman case in Newport, uh, where someone fell off the cliff, cliff walk and tragically became a paraplegic. Very intense case. We're tied up right now in the still ongoing from uh, both the Kacheri and, and Lynch administrations, the DCYF case uh, that the child advocate brought. That's involving hundreds of thousands of doc documents. We mentioned hospital conversions, unprecedented, four at once. So um, while sometimes maybe the caseloads by number might be dropping, the intensity of the cases, the uh, complexity of the cases is really getting involved. And, and I literally had this conversation with one of my division chiefs yesterday where they said to me, please don't take another person out of my division. I said, but I have, I'm responsible for the whole building and, and I have to make sure we allocate our resources as best we can. And sometimes that's a challenge. That goes to a question I had actually, which is, um, uh, you know, these guys kind of laughed at me when we were talking about it because every that. office says they need more resources, right? But uh, you've seen how with the rise in health care costs, it squeezed everything else in state government budgets, including including mm -hmm. law enforcement and office like yours. After two years, I mean, how what letter grade maybe would you give to the staffing level the assembly gives you in terms of the resources you have in the attorney general's office to prosecute? Because we don't have district attorneys. I'm from Massachusetts. It's all right. out of your office. We're, we're one of three in the country who's basically the DA. Um, what grade would I give the General Assembly yeah. as to my staffing levels? As to what you're getting in terms of resources. They have the same problem that I have when I mentioned to you the reallocation of resources. Well, the General Assembly has to allocate resources, i.e. taxpayer dollars, amongst all of state government. I get that dynamic. So what I try to do, and sometimes to the detriment of my own staff, is I may leave a position open a little longer so I can utilize the dollars for something else that needs to be fulfilled. So I do my best to manage my own budget, hopefully come in, and in fact we've come in, I believe, under budget or at budget every year since I've been there. And so I get that. I get what they give me, I'll work with it, and I'll, and I'll do the job and do the job well. At some point, hopefully the stresses of the office don't overtake us, but that being said, I'm in the process of upgrading technology. We just did a case management system in-house. All things that can help streamline us in-house. These are things that help make us more efficient and hopefully provide a better product for the citizens of the state and at the same time 
help me not go to the General Assembly and ask for more staff. General, very little time less, left, le less than a minute, and I want to bring this up. You've made texting while driving a big push. You've been visiting schools. Talk about that. Uh, it's been a great campaign. We've been to about 20 schools across the state. Uh, we've had a great response from the students. Basically, it's don't text and drive. It can wait. There is no message so important that you will risk your life, your passenger's life, or the person not riding the bike on the street's life. And we have a compelling video, and you can hear a pin drop when these kids are watching it. And we want to get them young before they develop the habit of texting while driving. I tell them that I'm old enough, the cars I drove in as a kid didn't have a seat belt. <laughs> I had to get in the habit of putting in that, it on. I want them to get in the habit of not texting. And, and by the way, it's illegal. I'm sure you're bringing it, it is illegal, but you know what? I tell them, take the penalties our office can give you. What you will go through personally if you kill someone will be the worst penalty you can suffer. Attorney General Peter Kilmartin, thank you very much for joining us this week. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. For Ian Donis and Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. That is fast. It goes by quick.